Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Alan Ladavat. I work at Crow Team, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about the Talos principle, and in general, our approach to making what we like to call big games with small teams. Uh, technically, I'm supposed to be the CTO or technical uh, chief at a team, but as a relatively small team, we all wear multiple hats, so I did a lot of work on design, general game design, and other issues on the Talos principle in our games. Um, I have to say in advance, if you've seen some of the talks about Talos principle before, maybe a lot of things are going to be that you already know. I hope that I was able to come up with some new stuff, and uh, I'm going to go a little bit broader on this one, try to cover more ground. Um, if you think that you would like to know anything more, any more details about some particular areas, please feel free to uh, drop me a question in the QA session afterwards, which I hope you'll have time for. Or if not, uh, feel free to email me or tweet at me. And uh, I like uh, talking about all the things about tech and design. So don't be shy. Um, I always hope that a lot of people have already tried and seen the Talos principle, but in talks like this, it's good to just... I like to run a short trailer so that we know what we're talking about for the people who maybe haven't seen the game. I wonder, who will you be, our children? Will you love us for having created you? Will the world you build be like ours, or so different that today we cannot even imagine it? Step into the light, child. Is there anything that we associate more closely with intelligence than curiosity? Our mythologies are full of riddles and mysteries and divine knowledge. My child. You may go freely to all the worlds of my garden. But if the tower tempts you, be wise. Do not let yourself be misled by doubt. For it shall bring death and the end of your generations. So be it. Let your will be done. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, uh, first of all, uh, a little bit about Crow Team, and when I say small teams, we are obviously not really, really small team in terms of many uh, modern indie teams that get to be one, two, three persons. Uh, but as you can see, the game is, uh, we, we like to call it almost AAA. Uh, we like to think that we are getting pretty close to the AAA quality and AAA amount of content in our games. And with a team that's been at most 25 people for all of these games that we've been creating for the past 20 years. And most of them, of them they were really top ranking in, uh, in reviews and in, in, in sales. Um, only recently, have we, after the Talos principle, started expanding towards more people, but uh, we still continue with our practices trying to uh, be very efficient. So because we do that just to be able to run more projects in parallel. Um, so, uh, about the Taos principle in general and how we started making it. This is, uh, I mean, based on the fact that most of our games before were serious Sam games, which is very action-packed, and this is kind of like a basic reactions of all the, all the people who know us said, why are we doing a philosophical puzzles and what happened there? Um, I, I like to show what some of the fans have made as, uh, as their interpretation of how they think we came to that. <laughs> so, 
So yeah, <laughs> they think we did. We, we were having much fun about it. In fact, well, it 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 it, it wasn't that way, really. Uh, so what we were doing, we were really, really honestly started working on Series M4. We were really deep into that. And uh, our uh, plan was, we had experienced previously that when you, when, you run, uh, for, when you run such a game with high-packed action uh, and uh, when you run it for an hour or two, you get very tired from all the action, so we have to insert some pauses. We, got, we started to get tired of all the find the switch, find the key, so we tried to make something more complicated. We came up with the concept of the jammers, and we were prototyping that, uh, and we uh, started uh, making simpler levels here. Uh, does it work? No, whatever. Okay, we started making levels uh, that contained a bit more complex puzzles with the new mechanics we came up with. We, we planned to use it in Series Sam 4. Uh, but it turned out, as we were creating more and more complex puzzles, people loved them. Uh, people always, that in our team, that tried the puzzles, they, try, they, they loved the more complex puzzles more than the simpler ones. And it went way past the level that you would say that you can put something like that as a puzzle inside an action game. Uh, so we were in a kind of dilemma. I mean, if we don't uh, put those puzzles in, we are wasting an opportunity and has a nice opportunity for a good game. Um, so the final result was that after a lot of deliberation and discussions, we decided uh, uh, to just change our focus and create a new game out of that. This is one of the very important things that uh, we always like to mention because we didn't just come up with some kind of idea out of the blue. We just, uh, this idea was uh, picked because we uh, accidentally made it and we knew that it was good. We picked it because we knew that people wanted to play it and we put that as a basis for the game. This, uh, we, we think, is one of, the ba uh, one of the most important reasons for the total success of the game. So what's interesting in, in all this production is also how much time it took. We had uh, puzzles, all, all of the puzzles look like this. All had the same walls, same grass everywhere, but we had all the puzzles. We had like 200 or something puzzles. And then um, uh, when we tested all of those puzzles, we put a large table, uh, maybe 20 people from the team played those puzzles, all of them. They rated each of them for difficulty, each of them for how much fun it is, and we timed them to know how much time it took them to solve it. Uh, and then we sorted the puzzles uh, in proper order based on that, so that we knew that we have easier puzzles in the beginning, harder at the end, and to make sure there's always, if there's some that is a little bit more boring maybe, but some of those you have to show so that the people learn new concepts, and then you intersperse that with some that, that everyone says is very fun. Uh, so after that, we, so for example, the first phase was several months, and to complete the entire game was about two years. So all the other work was done on, on creating the content and making, making those other things beside the gameplay of the game. Um, so we had a great gameplay, we knew that, but we knew that we cannot just sell the game based on that. I always like to say, uh, I'm sorry for, for that, uh, uh, for the fact that we have to spend so much time to add things onto the gameplay where the gameplay is supposed to be important, but that's the way that the world is right now and gamers, dis uh, gamers uh, uh, want to have something much more than just the good gameplay. So we knew we had good gameplay, we knew we can create visuals because that's what we do in all the previous games, we already have a, a good pipeline for that. And then we added a little bit more gameplay elements and we knew we needed a good story. So we looked around the internet and uh, for, for people who created great stories in the way that we wanted ours to be and came up with Tom Juber who also recommended Jonas Kiratsis and they created a really nice engaging story for, for the game. Uh, one other thing that's very important is that we were researching other uh, first person puzzlers and came to the conclusion that the, the big problem often is the fact that you pl come to one puzzle and if you cannot finish it, you're stuck. And based on our testing, we knew that there were some people who got stuck on some puzzle, which other, all other people deemed very simple, and those people could uh, finish all puzzles afterwards, but only 
very much later, when they returned to the first one, they then uh, hit their head and said, yeah, of course, I was, I was stupid, and now I know how to do it. So we knew that we, are, we must not force the linear gameplay, so we organized the, le the levels in a non-linear fashion. And besides all those things that we, that we very uh, early on decided that we have to do, we also knew we had to do it very quickly. And we wanted to do it much quicker th than it turned out in the end. And, but you all know if you make games that it never works uh, as you plan in that respect. Um, so one thing that's very important in the final polish and quality of the game was that we did a lot of iterations. Um, First thing is that when designers made the puzzles, they tested themselves and between each other, like three or four people co-created all the puzzles for the games. When they thought the puzzle was good enough, then we did all the pre-testing that I mentioned previously for everyone, then arranged the levels in the game. By game, I mean those years or something that, uh, that took us to put all the content together, make it visually more polished, add a story and everything. And it was, I think, around April 2014. The game was released at just before Christmas 2014. Uh, around April, we had something that we could call, this is a game, it's, you have everything in there, it's a story and everything. Then we did uh, first full play through internal testing on three different people in the team and came up with the result that it's basically okay, but some things are not, uh, not really polished and the story totally sucks and nothing nothing gets together, they don't understand anything. Then we did a lot of changes internally in there, about how we present the story, uh, uh, how we rearrange some of the levels or something, till we came to something that we thought was okay. Almost in parallel, we were working on uh, a demo for E3, where we put just a few puzzles in a smaller package in one level, and we ran that, I don't know how many hundreds of people played it at the, at the show, and there, um, we kind of like, not recorded, but remembered and wrote down all the, all the things that we noticed people have problems with it. We use that to change the way our mechanics are presented to the players, the way some things work, the way some puzzles are, are done, to make sure that people, when they come to the game for the first time, they, they, they can uh, get into it more easily. Then with, with all that feedback, in all, all those fixes, we did a close beta testing on a I think about 30 or 50 uh, of the beta testers that we had on Steam from previous games, we had their, their contacts and said, okay, guys, do you want to test the game? And they went through it. We got not just bug reports, but more important is that we got a lot of feedback about what they didn't like in the game. Uh, we also ran what we call friends testing, so invite a few friends into the office and not just uh, just let them play the game, but you watch them all the time while they play for hours and sometimes record the video and write down all the problems and talk about them. Why, why did you do that when you could have done some, uh, something else? Um, and based on that, we had another pretty large uh, set of changes. We removed some levels, uh, cut out some puzzles, added some new puzzles, changed more things in about how the story is pre presented. Um, then that, that was very already we were, we were running very close to, to Christmas, uh, we, we would have liked to have had more time to do even more iterations, but as you can see, the game, the game is already pretty polished if you played it. Uh, another thing, we, we ran a public test uh, of the game, which we used the same level as was used for E3 demo. The, the, this level was polished in the meantime, and then we uh, pushed it for free on Steam. It had several hundred thousand downloads, and we collected all the feedback back on there, uh, besides just the technical changes, uh, fixing all the problems on different hardware. We also had some very interesting insights into how different people look at the game, and some things that they change some things in the gameplay. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it a few slides later. Uh, the basic point is the final game is much more different than the alpha, which we would normally say this is the game, and previously in some projects we didn't have enough time, so we practically shipped what was alpha with just bug fixes. But it's a big difference. It would never have achieved that much success if it was the original alpha. Um, yeah, this, uh, Easter eggs. This is one of the things we came up uh, with after we showed the, uh, after we, s we seen the feedback to the public test. So what happened there was that we had, we had uh, 
um, what you call the secret stars, uh, one of the elements that you can pick uh, and uh, be used to unlock some other more advanced parts of the game and uh, more harder puzzles. And these stars were usually very hard to get. You see them, but you don't know how to get to them. Uh, but in the in the demo, for some reasons, we were like missing um, ability to put some stars. There were only only a few puzzles, but we need more stars. So we just scattered a few stars around, and the reactions to that were very interesting. Uh, some people loved finding those stars, and they say, "Yeah, cool," because I like to roam around and explore the areas because we created. Uh, open world with interesting visuals, so people just like to walk around, see the islands or, or mountains or whatever, and when they find something, they say, oh, go, cool, it's, it's super cool that I, s I have some kind of like a, um, reward for exploring. On the other hand, there are people who, um, who like to solve hard things, and they were into finding all the stars, when they realized that for some, finding some of the stars, you just have to stumble upon them, they were like, oh man, this is boring. So we had a conflict there, and if you know a little bit of theory, you, you will recognize the difference between explorers and achievers. So the achievers, they want to do something to get there, to get the stars, and explorers, they just want to wander around, but they still like to be rewarded. So we cut that dilemma uh, in a different way. So we made sure that all the stars are hard to get, but we put a lot of Easter eggs and secret texts, messages, stuffs uh, that are scattered around. So if you're an explorer who just wants to wander around, there's plenty of things that you can find, but the important thing is that we never track them. There's no way to know how many you have found and how many of them they are. So achievers are not interested into getting those because there's no stats on that. So that made everyone happy. That was a really big difference in, in, in our opinion and we, from the feedback that we got. A lot of bad feedback stopped after we did that. Easter eggs are very interesting because they seem like a low payoff. We've been going back and forth about how many Easter eggs and how complex to put in the games. And finally, after the Talos principle, I think we can say with very uh, high confidence that they seem like a low payoff, so we have to, have to invest a lot of time to create interesting uh, uh, Easter eggs because they usually need to have some specific content and if we use references to other games. We have references to Papers, Please, to Minecraft, to I don't know how many different things, to Doom, to Aliens. Um, uh, in, the, in the game, and it, it was a lot of content work to do all that. Uh, and not many people are going to find it, but it's like what they call black swans. There's only a little amount of people who find them, but when they do, they create a large community engagement, large viral media. They create YouTube videos about it. They create, uh, they create um, uh, guides on Steam that people look for, and uh, it, it helps both uh, to s uh, increase the visibility of the game and for the people who just, for example, stumble upon one Easter egg and they come, what's this? And they, other people tell them, uh, there's more of those, they search for those, and they, they get, you, you get people who would normally be in the community, you enter them into community, they start roaming forums and guides, and it's a pretty interesting uh, snowballing effect that happens because of all of that. Um, okay, so now a little bit about how we like to optimize things. One of the things that we use extensively for Talos, otherwise we would have spent even much more time, it's content reuse. So uh, you can see the level, this is a level for, uh, tra a screenshot from a trailer for Sirius M3, and there's Talos up there. So we're using a lot of the same elements for the Egyptian levels. They don't look exactly the same because of the different post-processing, different architecture layouts, but creating those models takes a lot of time. And we started reusing them very, uh, in very interesting ways. Um, originally, we were a li little bit afraid that the uh, fans are going to say, like, well, I, I don't like that because I saw that already. But realistically, in real world, I mean, you don't expect a Hollywood movie to create a specific new chair for each movie. They just get a chair and put it there. Or, or they go to a location and film in that location. So as long as it, make, is, uh, as, long as it makes sense, uh, it seems that people, a few people have tried to, to, to complain about that, but the other people without our, uh, our uh, involvement on the forums tell them, but what are you complaining? It's, it looks good, so why would it have to be new content? Um, 
The other thing that helps us a lot was uh, using the photo scanning. This is relatively recently that we've been able to set it up. Uh, you've probably heard about it before, so just very short, you, you go to some location, we use a lot of historical locations, you take a photos of some objects like a statue here from multiple angles, and then there's software that's going to create the model and uh, texture it. It usually has, like, I don't have the screenshot here, uh, you usually have like 15 million polygons or something, then you have to simplify it, it takes some handwork. Uh, uh, to do uh, manual work to do all that and uh, to come with a model like this with photo textures applied to that uh, and then it looks in the game it looks very similar uh, to what it looks in real life and saves a lot of time. Uh, okay now ab about some tools that we use here is the bug reporting tool that we use inside the game uh, so when you see a bug you just press like this and this is a bit of a cut. This is how the designer sees it in his editor. He sees this bug. When he's fixed the bug, he just uh, clicks to, to the checkbox and connects that with the perforce change list so uh, that you automatically know which change list fix which bug so the user knows, okay, I have to get at least this version number and my bug is going to be fixed. Um, this is a set of the uh, different build systems that we use, so there's uh, different build machines that they run all the builds continuously so that whenever something is reported as a bug, fixed, you very quickly uh, can get a new build uh, and see that the bug that you have reported has been correctly fixed and you can continue testing, doing whatever. And what's even more interesting for us is that in recently in the past few projects we've ha added uh, fully automatic testing which looked like this. So when a it's better this doesn't work on this screen, but um, once the um, once the uh, automated build machine has created a build, it's a build ready for Steam. It usually takes about half an hour to create after a change list. Then uh, another tester machine pulls that build, puts in puts the build into its Steam local Steam installation, and runs the test and runs something like this. So this is uh, a bot. Uh, this audio is okay. This this is a bot who plays the game in fast forward mode. So uh, this bot uh, takes about 20 minutes to complete the entire game, which a human tester who knows exactly what he's doing would need about 10 hours. The bot is not really that super smart because it just recorded actions in general. It's not. Uh, it's not like a recorded demo, it just like it records the concepts like okay you have to use this switch to open that door and then you have that, that item put it on there and it has like a uh, when you create a puzzle you play that puzzle and rec it, the system records what have you been do doing in concept and then the bot can replay your concept by using navigation to pathfinding to find the order or how, how to do the things uh, but it simplifies testing quite a lot. Uh, with, with all this system that takes about uh, half an hour to create a build and 20 minutes to run a test, uh, you, we have come to the point that between the time that I have submitted the change list and the time that I have a feedback email back, does my change list break something or is the game still completely functioning? Uh, we come to less than one hour, which is great for some scenarios, for example, if you're doing some changes in the physics or in the jumping mechanics in the game, it's very hard for a game this long to be sure that you haven't broken anything. We used to spend a lot of time, like, then going through all the levels, checking all the things, and sometimes you, you, you miss something and then you, something comes back three weeks later and you, you're not sure which of the change list broke that. Now, uh, we often just, you're not sure but just submit it and within one hour you will know if you broke something in jumping. Um, our savings in, in, in man time was immense because uh, we, we've calculated that the bot has played what would have been equivalent of 15,000 hours of human testing, which means we would have eight people more hired just to play the game all day, every day, uh, besides them, be bo uh, them being bored to death. Uh, they probably would have missed a lot of things that the bot cannot miss and we would never be able to have feedback in one hour. Uh, the point, very, inter very important point to, 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 br to uh, carry over is that um, this system cannot prove that there are no bugs in the game. It's still possible to get sucked somewhere or something, but what it can prove that it's 
uh, possible to complete the game. So you're 100% sure that you didn't make any blocker bug in the game that makes the, the game impossible to complete, which we had a lot of problems previously. Uh, for example, there were cases where someone said, I'm going to just retexture this door, and as a side effect, which is something complicated to explain, but it can happen, he accidentally click something and the door wouldn't open anymore. So you have like, and it, it's like in the level number seven, so how, how long does it take for you to know that just changing this texture made it so that this game is effectively not shippable? If you ship that, uh, people are gonna come like, okay, I cannot finish the game anymore. So this is what the system is for. It makes you sleep better. It, it still doesn't completely remove the necessity, necessity to test the game, but it uh, helps a lot. Uh, Okay, now no, no post-mortem is complete without a little bit of what went wrong. Uh, obviously, hopefully not too many things went wrong if it's a successful project, so this is a short slide relatively. The biggest problem we had was localization because the game has a lot of text, a lot of story in there. Uh, we were a bit silly to think that uh, some uh, uh, localization company would be able to, to do it as quickly as they promised and as cheaply as they promised, uh, so that failed big time. That had, uh, there was unrealistic that anyone would be able to translate in that little time, and because there was not much time, we didn't do a lot of testing, we just took whatever they, they had, we put it in, in and did another cycle and then shipped that. And we should have done a lot of testing with native uh, speakers just playing the game, like someone who never played the game before, then played in Polish, German, French, whatever, to notice all the internal inconsistencies in the text. Uh, of course, what I mentioned previously, we could have always used more time to test and to improve the whole thing further uh, by taking into account feedback of players to make the game more fun and, and remove the problems that they saw. There was a couple of things that people always m noticed that, uh, for example, our our hinting system that was supposed to help you if you're stuck in some puzzles was such badly tuned that it was ridiculous because uh, it was too hard to get any hints at all. A couple of things like that, but it's pretty solid even with all those problems. Um, and the, one of the riskiest things was we were too tight to, to, towards the winter sales. We, we always knew we have to release before Christmas so to get all the money from the winter sales. It's always important when the game is relatively fresh. But what we didn't expect, we released like a few days before and it was, it was okay. But what we didn't expect completely, didn't know that it would be a possible problem, is that we missed a lot of potential places in Game of the Year's list. A lot of the magazines and, and, and portals said that the game is great, but uh, they already created their Game of the Year list for 2014, so we were not on there. And when 2015 comes, it's a 2014 game, so it's not there, so it's not on any of those lists. That, was, that sucked a little bit, but what can you do? Uh, so, for a short recap, I think um, the most important thing is that we started from a good gameplay idea. It was accidental, but uh, in a good game developer, I think it's always the, the biggest, uh, the, the, the best uh, virtue is if you can see something that's really good and say, wow, man, this, is, this plays well. And that's what, what we saw there and we latched onto that, didn't let go and created a whole game out of that. That was the best thing. Uh, we planned to have all the, all the extras and put it in on there, probably wouldn't sell nearly as much or, or be nearly as popular without all that, things that engage the player. Uh, did a lot of iterations to be able to bring all that into a, a proper product. And we concentrate, as we always do, on a lot of efficient processes and tools, uh, which are kind of like just an enabler, but without that we would need much more people or much more time. I think that's it for now, and we have about 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. So, no one has any questions? Oh. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Can I play the Telos principle in VR? 
Uh, well, yes and no. There, there is an implementation in there. There's a, there's a console variable you can start on, on, on launch, and it's going to allow some VR, mostly some of the older headsets. In the newer headsets with head position tracking, we had a lot of problems with that, and for now we're not working on trying to make that uh, better because we're not sure how we could make a game like that work correctly with uh, headsets that have like room scale or in general posi uh, head tracking posi uh, head position tracking because if you move like this, a lot of the things are currently in the game uh, organized about how you, when you when you grab a jammer, you put it here and it looks from your perspective and it operates from there. So if you move, then you can push your head through the wall and then jammer is effectively through the wall and then you can jam through that. There will be a lot of cases to cover. We decided that for now we are not going to touch that. We're going to need some more time to, to come up with uh, different approaches for different uh, different kind of gameplay or different kind of the user interfaces. I think everyone who have been working on, on, on uh, VR games know that it's a completely different thing and just porting a non-VR game into VR is always a problem. Of course, for me as well, it's, it's the biggest irony in the VR that when I first saw VR, I always wanted to have it. I wanted to have it to play the classic first-person games, like first-person shooters and first-person puzzlers. I want to play it in VR and be there. And the fact, the sad fact right now is that we just unfortunately cannot get it because this is exactly the only class of games that you cannot really play well in VR. This is the problem. Uh, I guess if you ask something like, that, like this, you're probably one of the minority who would uh, just tolerate all the problems that are there, but would just like to be able to get a headset and be in the game and play it with a controller. But uh, unfortunately, most of the people, more than 95%, are unable to play a VR game with a controller because when you start, once you start to move, they get motion sickness. And it doesn't uh, make sense to invest much resources into that when 95% of people cannot even play it. That's unfortunate. Have a question? question? A question. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so I guess you make your own tech engine and tools. Yes, yes. Um, so a few questions. Why did you decide to make your own? And then how big is the, the tech team? Your talk is about keeping it small. So how did you manage to keep it small? And do you support all platforms then? Yes. Uh, uh, okay. So initially, when we started with our first tech, uh, that was the only choice we could have made because we started that in 2000. I mean, we shipped the first game 2001. We started 1995, 7, depends on how we count. Uh, back then, we were poor students. All the engines that you could get were a million dollars or something, and we just made our own because it was the only choice we could do. Uh, as we came forward, we saw that we like it that way because we have a good control, and uh, now is a time where a lot of people want, and uh, with, uh, I, I think in a lot of cases with uh, good reason, use uh, pre-made engines that are very general purpose, like uh, Unreal and Unity. Um, and it's, it, it's not a bad idea in itself, but it's, it has some drawback because you cannot uh, get that specific for some of the things. So for us, uh, coming between uh, how specific, how specifically we can optimize things for our game and uh, how much uh, cheaper it is, especially uh, up until recently, uh, it is to uh, not have to pay for an external engine. We still feel that it's, uh, it's a good choice. And uh, I think it's maybe that we, are, we might be coming up uh, from this dip in the usage of custom engines. And you come uh, to see more teams having their engines for different reasons. Like uh, if you look at the Dying Light or The Order or other games that are really interesting that have been doing their tech for, for different reasons. And I think we'll keep that way. Uh, as, a, as about the size of our team, tech team, for most of those things, there are about six, seven programmers. Uh, most of them also working on other things, uh, on game uh, content code and things. Um, I say small team. I think 25 people for a game of this kind of uh, magnitude with uh, uh, with uh, own custom engine. And this this game shipped on PC, on PS4, and on Android, which is I think the the, the one of the very rare, or maybe the one. Uh, game which is this detailed in content and, and in, in uh, quality of rendering that actually runs on Android. So 
I, I think I like to think that we are doing pretty well in, in that respect on the amount of engineers that we can use to create this amount of tech. Does it answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, we have people here. Hi. Uh, how was your workflow regarding designing puzzles and stuff? Uh, deciding puzzles? Uh, designing. Uh, designing. Uh, you saw it on the, one of the first slides. Uh, for most of the things, uh, people just came up with some ideas. And uh, in most cases, they drew it on paper or created little Lego blocks. And then we, we had very, as you saw, very simple thing that we had all the same textures. We had pre-made walls. Um, and you create the puzzles from preset walls of sizes, three meters, five meters, two meters, uh, and a flat, flat floor, create all that. Uh, and then uh, those puzzles were tested, as, as I said there. As about the ideas for the puzzle themselves, um, people, when, when the designers started to work on, on the puzzles, when they, you touch on some mechanics like, like the jammer, and you say, okay, I can use the jammers with the doors in this way, and then you come up with some very complex things that you can do, uh, it usually brings you an idea for several puzzles, and it also uh, forces you to create a few several simpler versions so that people can be uh, smoothly br brought into it. So they, okay, jammer can jam the door, okay, but then you have the, the counter jamming with two jammers, and you can do it this way and that way. And then it, sometimes people just come up with a more complex puzzle. We test the puzzle, say, okay, it's interesting, but it would have been better if I knew before that I can use two jammers, then we create a separate puzzle that teaches you that. So those were different ways that, that we came up with those puzzles. What's interesting to, to, to when I'm talking about it to mention is that we had these blocks uh, that for walls that you create a uh, puzzle with them, and we had a script because we didn't know what's going to be the ordering of the puzzles in terms of different environments, and we have four environments. So we had even more because the medieval has the normal and the snowy version. And so we had scripts that you run on a level and that just replaces the generic models with Roman models, Egyptian models. So you get like, a, in a seconds, you get from a generic level into a Roman level or a Egyptian level. Then, of course, there's a lot more work just decorating, editing the grass, adding more statues. And, but general walls and columns, they get out to, out to convert into a proper episode. That also saved a lot of time. Okay. okay. Okay, can I ask? Um, uh -huh. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not following the mic, just go on. Sorry. Okay, um, how did you uh, financially access the project? I mean, doing um, shooters and then a puzzle game must be a big financial risk. Uh, did you have uh, like one point where you say this is going to be sell well, or was it a big risk? Um, well, it's, you're never sure with the games, you know how it is. Um, uh, where it's going to sell well, uh, I have to say we were quite uh, afraid and, until the last moment. We saw some of the, the projects that failed, that didn't really really work well. For example, Meg Runner was disappointed for us to see how, how well, uh, how, how, how it didn't really go that well, but it had a good potential. But we saw that some games did, and of course, there's always the ideal of Portal, which, <laughs> which in the last year always wanted to make something similar to that. Uh, it showed that obviously it's not only shooters that people want and like to play first person puzzle. The only case was are we able to make a good enough one, and are we able to market it? well and it seems out that it, it worked out it was a kind of like a leap of faith on one side but it's always good to be sure that i know i saw it i played it it was super fun all my friends played whoever i left let to play they all said it's super fun okay now if we fail i don't know what to say that's that's the way that we we assess that it's very hard to to, to be able to be sure in, in game i mean we, we can you can be more sure when you're making a sequel than this, but sometimes you have to make a new IP like this. Okay, sorry. Uh, how was the process of working with an external writer? Uh, well, it was great. It was great, and especially because those were two external writers, you would say it would be complicated, but they are great guys, and they are, what's important, they are not just like some writers. They are very experienced game writers. Jonas, for example, he makes his own games and ships them, so he knows what we are talking about when we say something like, this cannot be made in the games, because there is a problem with gameplay, and Tom as well, he's very versed, he worked on very important projects, very, very well uh, received, like uh, uh, Driver San Francisco, and uh, he had some games of his own also. 
um, it was irrational, I think it's the name. Uh, and so they know, they know the process, they know the, all the, um, how do you call it, the, um, the balances that we have to do between gameplay and story, and they really cooperated well, and we are very, very happy, and we continue to work with them on further projects. Okay. Um, someone there? I'm there. I'd just like to ask as quickly, did you have any external teams working on the game, like external outsourced? Uh, no, we had an external writer, and we have some people that work remotely, but did work for us. It's uh, uh, one guy who created the bot and some of the other tech. Uh, he's a long-time uh, friend, uh, and f he, he worked on mods for some of our previous games, and we hired him a few projects ago to work on bots and things like that. And, uh, uh, but we don't. We didn't really go to an art outsourcing company and and request code from them. No, if if that's the question, no. Okay, there's a guy in the middle who wants to. Hello. Hello. Uh, first and foremost, thanks for a great game. Uh, solving Thank those you. puzzles made me feel like a genius. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So my question is really simple. Will there be more? Will there be more? Uh, yes. That's we will, we will make Talstow. That's, that's not a secret. We cannot... People want DLC. Unfortunately, in the state that the, 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 the market is, DLC don't really pay off unless they are day one DLCs. And day one DLCs are not very really loved. So we're in a kind of like a dilemma here about DLCs. But Talstow is going to happen. Is that, oh, we have one question here. Hello. So a bit of continuation question. Will there be more serious Sam? Because that really <laughs> sparked my love yes. again towards first person yes. shooters a couple yes, of years yes. ago. Yes. yes, there will be more serious Sams in plural, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Thanks. It sometimes takes more time because we got distracted, as you see. <laughs> but we are we're still working on Sam 4. Don't worry. It's going to be something, something uh, very interesting when you see it. OK. Is that all? We still have like three minutes if anyone has a question. Or you just want to scratch your back or something. <laughs> OK. I guess that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>